Rocky Mountain National Park in Colorado appears majestic and pristine, but is everything truly in harmony? Ammonia, a basic atmospheric gas emitted from livestock and other farms, reacts in the air with nitric acid from cars and other combustion sources. This reaction forms nitrogen particles which are borne on the wind and deposited in the park. As a result, the park's fragile ecosystem is changing. How can livestock operations help preserve this national treasure? The Park Service has been doing research up at Rocky Mountain National Park for over 20 years now, and what they found is very surprising. They find that nitrogen, even in very low quantities, is causing changes to the ecosystems in the park. Areas that the public normally thinks as pristine were not necessarily as pristine as we all hoped they might be. When visitors come to the park, it's sometimes hard for them to see what might be happening um, in the water or below ground or in the air that they don't necessarily see with the naked eye. The Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment has done an ammonia inventory and is estimating that 60 percent of the ammonia emissions in the state are coming from agriculture with 20 percent coming from fertilizer and 40 percent coming from livestock production. Now we're, we're faced with something that's almost invisible and that's nitrogen deposition as the result of ammonia and so it's a new impact for us but one that we need to, to address. The work of atmospheric scientists and environmental chemists is focusing on where does that really come from and what are the sources. There are lots of sources of ammonia but ag is certainly a big one. The second most important deposition pathway was wet deposition of nitrate coming mainly from probably combustion sources. Once ammonia moves into particles, it can have a lifetime on the order of a week. And that might mean transport over a distance of a thousand miles or perhaps more. How do ammonia emissions become nitrogen particles? Combustion sources like vehicles and industry release nitric acid and hydrocarbons into the air. At the same time, nitrogen fertilizers from agricultural fields, golf courses and homes along with manure from livestock farms, release ammonia gas. Ammonia gas reacts in the atmosphere with nitric acid and hydrocarbons to create very small nitrogen particles which are carried through the air for long distances. These nitrogen particles can be deposited anywhere, even in fragile ecosystems. This resulting nitrogen enrichment can have unintended effects on the surrounding environment. Basically, we have high ammonia emissions from when, wherever there is a high amount of manure, when, where manure is accumulated, like in manure storage or treatment facilities, or when manure just uh, builds up in lots. We estimate that now nitrogen is about 20 times higher than it was under natural conditions historically and that nitrogen is causing changes in the park. These communities don't have much capacity to take up nitrogen and to use nitrogen. Therefore, the nitrogen that they're taking in is, is likely to change those communities fairly uh, significantly. The levels sound low from an agricultural standpoint. They're only in the range of like three to seven pounds of nitrogen per acre. But because of the fragility of the ecosystems up there, and there's very little buffering capacity, that, uh, uh, that small amount ends up having a large impact. In alpine meadows, for instance, nitrogen acts as a fertilizer and it can favor some plants over other plants. What we've seen is a slight shift from native wildflowers to sedges and grasses instead. Um, this changes the food source of the small mammals up in that area, and it just has changed the dynamics of the ecosystem. Nitrogen also gets into the lakes and streams of Rocky Mountain and causes changes in the food webs in those lakes and streams. Phytoplankton, the algae the, that are the basics of the food chain in those lakes has been changed over the years. And when we see changes in those food webs, it's an indication that uh, the ecosystems in the park are being affected. 
Well, as a producer, I'm, I'm a part of Colorado agriculture, of course, and Colorado agriculture is implicated as a contributor to nitrogen deposition in the park. We brought in our agricultural community and, and began talking to them about concerns of nitrogen in the park. With air, you can't see it. Sometimes you can smell it. Very often, you can't. You cannot smell nitrogen deposition. If, it's, if, if you have small, small levels of, of ammonia, you probably are used to them. And so it's kind of intangible. And some people don't want to believe it. And so people are still questioning how responsible they are. And they really need to be convinced of their role before they're going to be willing to make changes. And these are, of course, ongoing studies. Um, so how large our contribution isn't really delineated, but I think we can accept that we are a part of that problem. There was a lot of disbelievers and a lot of people that shook their heads and said that, you know, this can't be. Um, the winds blow from the west. How can it be us in the east? The question that often comes up is, how does material from the east end up moving back to the west and potentially impacting a place like Rocky Mountain National Park? Uh, in Rocky Mountain National Park, the prevailing winds, as in most of the country, are from the west. But there are certain conditions that tend to drive flow from the east back up uh, against the mountains and up into the park. There really are two main kinds of scenarios that could explain how material from the east gets transported towards the west and back up to Rocky Mountain National Park. One of those are upslope snowstorms. These are very typical events, especially in the springtime. The reason that the air moves in these periods from east to west has to do with the low pressure centers that tend to move across the southern part of the state of Colorado. And the air around the low pressure at the surface is flowing counterclockwise. Air is wrapping around that low back up against the mountains and producing these very heavy precipitation events. The other scenario that we're interested in that brings air from the east to the west is more important in the summertime. And this is what we refer to as a mountain valley wind circulation. Uh, during the summer when the heating from the sun is strong, as that heats the mountain, the air in contact with the mountain warms, expands. During the day that heating leads to a flow up the mountain slope. At night, the reverse pattern occurs where air in contact with the mountain slope cools rather quickly and you get denser air that tends, tends to flow kind of like a river back down along the mountain slope. So pretty much every day in the summer, uh, on the east slope of the Rockies, you'll see air come from the east, flow to the west, up along the mountain slope, and at night return. What we saw with some of our real-time measurements was when the flow switched to coming from the east, we first saw concentrations of ammonium and nitrate and gas phase ammonia and other things increase quite dramatically. And then once the precipitation started, we saw a large flux of these materials as they were being scavenged from the air mass and deposited to the surface. What's happening in the ecosystems of Rocky Mountain National Park, we should pay attention to that because that might be happening in other places outside the park as well. The air doesn't arrive at a state boundary and stop. The pollutants don't all fall out within the same state in which they're emitted. So really we need to understand more about regional sources, even larger scale sources. So there have been many best management practices that have been hypothesized or have been tested in laboratories, but haven't really been tested under field conditions. What we're doing is we're taking management practices that have been shown in the literature and laboratories to work, and we're putting those on real world farms to see how they actually work in a real world setting with management um, constraints and concerns. Well, conserving nitrogen, in, in a sense, means feeding less nitrogen. And, and right now, yes, that, that is a very profitable um, best management practice, if you will. Uh, allows us to feed our cows a little cheaper and um, at the same time reduce the um, ammonia and nitrogen emissions. Of the types of management practices that we're looking at 
are things like different types of beddings, the dairies, uh, if there are any successful surface mitigations for feedlots, uh, different ways to manage compost and lagoons, um, things like that, practices that where we have the most amount of ammonia emissions where manure would be. If they are successful at reducing emissions and they're also practical, cost effective and efficient for operators to use, then we recommend those tools to livestock producers to use on their farms. So we have both livestock and crop producers that sit down and have developed a plan to try to voluntarily reduce their emissions. And we need to accept um, our responsibility and, and make as many changes and improvements as we can. What we found is that producers are very open to working with us and they're very willing to adopt these practices if we can show them that they're economical and practical and they are going to make a difference. Oftentimes when people think of national parks, they realize that they're part of a bigger picture, um, but when we deal with issues like atmospheric deposition and other environmental changes or issues, it emphasizes that national parks are not in a bubble, but they certainly are impacted by what's happening around them. Well, I think we have to be open to, to adopting new practices financially um, and as stewards of now of the air and water. We, we have to be good neighbors, not only to our neighbors, but to our state and our environment.